I'm Caroline Modaresi Tirani. You're watching Half Post Live. Where we live has an enormous impact on how well we live. That's why more cities are developing urban spaces that are conducive to promoting health and happiness. Well, joining me now to discuss how the designs of our cities can influence wellness are Claire Fellman, Director and Landscape Architect for Snowheta, Colin Eller, Director of the Research Laboratory for Immersive Virtual Environments, Julie Rusk, Assistant Director of the Wellbeing Project, and Tom Fisher, Director of the Metropolitan Design Centre at the University of Minnesota. So thanks all very much for joining us. And Julie, I'll start with you. What does the Wellbeing Project actually do? Well, thanks. Thanks for having us. This is really exciting to talk about this topic. We've really set out to do what we think is a first of its kind um, measurement and creation of a framework, really, to tell us about something very fundamental, which is how people are doing. And it really does relate to the design of public spaces and our communities and our health and our economic opportunity, how we really live and work together in our communities. So, you know, talk to me a little bit about how a community like Santa Monica, for example, can actually improve on its city. Because if people think of Santa Monica, they think of the gorgeous beach, uh, of being by the ocean, of bigger sidewalks. It sounds pretty perfect. How can that city improve? Well, you know, Santa Monica is a real city like places across the country and the world. And we have people who are going to work every day and trying to make ends meet and really care about how their kids grow up and their ability to live lives that, that thrive. So we really are just like any other city in spite of what many people may think about us. So what we're doing is really um, refining our understanding of, of how people are doing. And it's been fascinating because in working with an international panel of experts, we developed this framework, we've collected data, we're mining social media, and we really have learned quite a bit about how things are going very well and what we can be proud of and build upon, but also some areas that we really need to work on. And we think this is something that can be shared with others as well. So what are the areas that really need to be worked on at the moment? Well, you know, it, it, interestingly, we're a community where people are in, very engaged. Um, over 70% of people who can vote, vote. And yet what we learned was that people feel that their ability to influence local government is really more limited than we might have thought. We also learned that people are extremely stressed. They're working hard to keep their lives going. And, you know, we want to do some things that really help us to focus resources and policies of our government towards the things that matter, which is improving the thriving and the well-being of people. Yeah, Colin, talk to us a little bit more about how psychologically our spaces, where we live, impacts our mental health and well-being. Oh, there's a tremendous range of, of different kinds of effects of the physical environments on our, our state of health, happiness, and, and well-being. Probably the place to start is one of the most well-studied areas in environmental psychology and neuroscience, and that is the effect of exposure to natural spaces. Um, we tend to think sometimes of the, the park settings, the natural parts of a city, as being almost the dessert that we think about planning after the, the main course. But in fact, those kinds of spaces are fundamental to our health. And there's a, a deluge of research showing that even quite brief exposure to a natural setting can have a range of bodily effects from uh, changing our arousal levels to reducing uh, stress-related hormones like cortisol. So one of the contributions of, of experimental psychology and neuroscience has been to kind of map out that relationship between health and natural environments. But um, you can think of all kinds of other uh, variables in cities that will influence the ways that people will feel. Uh, drilling right down even to something like the design of, of street level facades. Um, the, the design of a facade we've shown has a profound impact on how people feel as they're walking down a street. Uh, so, for example, one of the most dramatic things that we've found is that if you have people uh, faced with either a really boring, sterile facade or one that's overwhelming in complexity, then you can actually measure changes in facial expression. People have more anger in their faces when they're faced with those odds. So that's, and that's interesting. That's really interesting, Colin, you know, this idea of anger. I just want to read a comment from Xavier Santana, who's watching. He says, lower my taxes and stabilize my rent, and that's more than enough for me to enhance my happiness. Anything else is just upper middle class and elitist class privilege. Do you agree? Uh, 
Well, I think that, uh, yeah, taking care of those fundamentals is, uh, is, is really important. I mean, one of the, uh, the problems that people have with city life is that in spite of whatever amenities might be able to be provided in the physical environment, People are stressed by things like the the lack of time. They're stressed by the uh, uh, the reality of having long commutes, for example, to their workplaces. All of which take them out of whatever the physical environment could potentially provide them to uh, increase positive affect. But you know, it's interesting because that comment sort of suggests that thinking about design, thinking about urban spaces and design of urban spaces or rural spaces is some kind of privileged conversation. But if you're saying that you know parks uh, and green spaces shouldn't be the dessert when it comes to urban planning, do you agree that this idea of actually thinking about how a city is structured is a privileged idea, or do you think it should be one of those fundamentals like rate, like lower taxes? I think that sometimes, uh, unfortunately, it is uh, a privileged idea in the sense that we may design amenities in cities that are are more available to those who have more leisure time uh, than they are to those who aren't. And I think that's a critical problem. I think that uh, the people who are most stressed, the people who are, are struggling the most to get by, are probably the ones who could benefit the most from being able to find exposure to uh, pleasant settings, uh, natural environments, amenable public spaces. And so the problem is to find ways to provide access to everyone um, to, to those kinds of psychologically amenable effects. Yeah, I think that's a really good point as well. Uh, Claire, I want to bring you in because you are a part of the team that's looking at the redesign of uh, Times Square, not necessarily known for being one of the most harmonious spaces uh, in New York City. So what are you tackling in Times Square specifically? So we've been working on the Times Square project um, for about the last five years, and actually it's in construction now um, and is half complete. Um, so we're starting to see some of the um, effects of our uh, of our design work in the space. Um, we were working with the New York City Department of Transportation and um, the D Department of Design and Construction for the city. Um, following their pilot project, which closed Broadway to vehicles. This was a really radical move for the city to take. Um, you know, they, they started it out as a pilot project uh, just to see how it would affect vehicle traffic speeds and how it would be embraced by, you know, um, New Yorkers uh, living and working there. So um, after a full year of, of um, pilot project, they uh, – you know, it was a it was a amazing success, um, and so we've been working um, since 2010 on a uh, permanent design for the space. Um, one of the great luxuries that we had uh, working as a New York firm is is um, you know being able to go to the space and observe um, frequently what's going on out there. Um, how we can, what are the needs that weren't being met um, in the kind of cacophony and chaos that was existing there, um, you know, over the last 10 years. I so mean, that's, a good, that's a good point, you're addressing the cacophony and chaos. I wanted to yeah. show, show you guys rendering again. Let's get that image up again uh, <laughs> from the company, from, uh, from Snerta's company. There you go. You can see that there, right? Now, I've got to say, there, I think that is about five in the morning, there are that few people <laughs> in Times Square. So, you know, when it comes to actually addressing in that problem, I think one of the things that being in Times Square, one can feel extremely claustrophobic. The idea of there being any space, not necessarily green space, but just bloody personal space, mm -hmm. is kind of out the window. How are you guys thinking about that? Well, basically, um, carving out a uh, new platform for pedestrian occupation within that space is critical. One of the things that our design does is um, really builds it. it, it it basically takes away the original curbs of Broadway and extends uh, a plaza, you know, from from building front to building front. Um, getting rid of those curbs, um, creating a unified floor for the bow tie that's not. Um, you know, filled with lots of redundant infrastructure, extra light poles, fire hydrants, mailboxes. A lot of streamlining has been done, which is kind of the unsexy part of the project, I would say, but it's the, uh, you know, reality of, 
um, creating more space for people there. Um, and it's a tremendous coordination uh, effort that the city's undertaken. Simultaneous to this, they're, they're upgrading all of the infrastructure underneath the plaza. So um, creating that new platform for pedestrian occupation um, as well as, as events and amenities that, um, you know, draw people to the space, that's not always a problem. I, as you mentioned, you know, there, there is, you know, extreme um, pedestrian congestion there at rush hour um, and on the weekends. And so one of the key things uh, that our design work was um, aimed at was really streamlining um, orientation. So we've created these really mega uh, furnishings that um, are created of solid granite. Um, those are not in place yet, but we're really looking forward to them, their installation this September. Okay. Um, so, Claire, so, I want to ask you something, just in terms of the yeah. takeaway, right? You know, when I think of Times Square, I think of probably like three adjectives, uh, claustrophobic, cramped, and this isn't really an adjective, but selfie sticks. They're all over the place now, right? They're in your face. Like, you just, they're the three adjectives I think of when I think of Times Square. Uh, what are your hopes that the three adjectives will be after this process is complete? I would say um, we're looking to create a space that's generous, comfortable, and a place for people to stop and spend some time. Love it. Okay, great. So, that, I mean, I think that that is something that people can feel like they want to be a part of and they want to have that in their city. Uh, and, Tom, I want to bring you into the conversation because this is sort of something that you uh, are working at in Minneapolis. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about how you're trying to make Minneapolis a better place, a healthier place and space for people to live. Well, there's a lot of investment going on in the Twin Cities, both Minneapolis and St. Paul, in parks and open space. We were We've been the last few years listed as the number one park city in the country by the Trust for Public Land. We're also one of the healthiest uh, large cities in the country. And we also have a terrific economy. And we think those things are all related, that investments in parks and open space are a way to improve the general health of the population. And as well, they're incredibly powerful economic drivers. So the the viewer who said, you know, forget about parks, I just want my lower rent. Well, in fact, investments in parks and open space are the ways to stimulate the economy to create more jobs uh, and to um, basically improve opportunities for people. I mean, we shouldn't forget that the very first major park in the U.S., Central Park by Frederick Law Olmsted, was envisioned by him as a place where people of all incomes and of all ethnicities could come together. So these are great places to gather diverse populations and give everybody the same opportunities. You know, I think one of the sort of through line threads for a lot of the plans I'm seeing is just this influx of green space. And, you know, how viable is it in certain cities, particularly when we're seeing population growth exploding? Well, there's a tremendous amount of underutilized publicly owned land. In fact, we're doing some research with that right now in our region, which is looking at uh, little bits of land that cities have not realized could, in fact, serve for eco services, can, in fact, serve as uh, pocket parks. Um, as Colin said, you know, even a very small exposure to nature has so many benefits for people. And so what we're helping cities realize is that uh, there's valuable assets in the open space they, they now own and control that they're not utilizing. Yeah, Julie, I mean, talk to me about that. Obviously, in Santa Monica, there are a lot of open spaces. You've got the ocean right there. Uh, are they being underutilized in certain ways? Well, I think this is a great point. And for instance, reclaiming parking spaces. San Francisco has been at the forefront of this. We're beginning this in Santa Monica, looking at how our streets not only are places to connect people, but they're places where people can and get around, but they're p places where people can come and have some respite. And, and I think the, the, the point that Tom just made about looking for and thinking creatively about our open spaces is really, really critical. And I think I'd, what I'd really like to do is connect this as well with what we know about the science and the emerging research about really what helps people to do well in their lives. And, you know, we've, we've likened this a bit to sustainability. 25 years ago, people didn't quite understand sustainability as a movement. It was a new and burgeoning concept. And now here we are um, a, a quarter of a century later and 
the environmental movement is well embedded into our policies at all level of lo lo all levels of government, really local government as well as working hard at the federal level, which is obviously critical. Mm. And also, it's changing how individuals live their lives. And we really think that this same construct of using the emerging research and science around well-being will help to change how we design our cities, how we enact policies, how we allocate resources so that we're really using more specific information that helps us be more effective in all of those areas. So we're, we're quite excited about it. I think that's a good point. I've got a comment here from iSapien who's watching. He says, Tom makes a good point. A livable environment doesn't just help one class over another. We all benefit from it. Uh, Colin, I know you've done a lot of research about cities, uh, not just in the United States, but around the world. Where at the moment is the healthiest place to live in terms of well-being? That's a very hard question. I think that it's um, probably um, a mistake to think of, uh, to try to identify a, an entire city that is the healthiest and happiest place to live and rather to think about parts of cities. Mm -hmm. And to again, th uh, think about uh, the connection with green space, which I think is really important. I think that uh, the ideal would be that um, an ideal city would have uh, refreshing green space within about a five minute walk of anybody who lived in the city. So as, as Tom said, we don't need gigantic central parks or, or Hyde parks to produce these effects. In fact, it's probably much more important to take advantage of these smaller spaces that are more accessible to everyone. Uh, most New Yorkers don't go to Central Park on a regular basis, but if there's a parkette at the end of your street with a bench and a few trees, you're much more likely to use it on a on a regular basis. Yeah, I think that that's excellent. It really is, and you know, somebody who lives in the city, uh, you know, I live in Queens, and I certainly don't trek to Central Park uh, every spare weekend. But we are lucky enough that we do have these community parks in our neighborhood that we can access. Uh, not everybody has that luxury though. Uh, you know, Tom, talk to me a little bit about your plans for Minnesota because uh, there's a huge influx of money, $6.5 billion in fact, uh, from the Mayo Clinic to try and make Minnesota or Rochester, Minnesota, the healthiest city uh, in the United States. How are you gonna go about doing that? Well, this is an effort that the Mayo Clinic has spurred, which is the notion of how do you make um, an entire population much healthier? This, I think, is being driven in part by the Affordable Care Act, which now has created incentive for health providers to keep people healthy and out of the hospital rather than only dealing with their illnesses once they're sick. And uh, so uh, the Mayo Clinic and Rochester, Minnesota, have really taken on this notion of uh, what would it take to engage the entire population? So they've envisioned this idea of a destination medical center uh, for the city, but we are working with them to sort of identify working with populations, very diverse populations about what they consider to be healthy lives and what are the barriers to their healthy lives. I mean, we live in a world where the food system makes all its profit off of sugar, fat, and salt. And so we have an economy which is c consciously making us all ill. And uh, so how do we turn that around? How do we, in fact, recognize that better public health is better for our economy and uh, create an economy that makes being healthy the easy, cheap, and fun thing to do rather than what it is now, which is it's often viewed as too expensive, too hard, and no fun. Yeah. And uh, so I think Mayo's vision is really compelling. So what are the top five things that actually would make Rochester, Minnesota the healthiest city in the United States? Well, Dan Buettner's work in Blue Zones is part of this, which is the ways in which it's not just physical health, it's also social health, knowing your neighbors. That's one of the ways to have resilient communities. Um, it's about access to nature, as, as we've been talking about. Um, it's, it's about um, not overworking. It's about uh, knowing where your food comes from and uh, having enough time in your life to actually prepare healthy foods rather than being dependent on fast food. And there's a number of things we know. I think what's interesting for us is we know what it is like to lead a healthy life. The difficulty is how do we actually enact that? How do we put that into place? And how do we overcome all of the toxic qualities of the American economy and American culture, which is working against this? That's interesting. Claire, what do you think about that? 
I'm sorry, repeat that? Yeah, just in terms of trying to remove some of the toxic elements of yeah. not only our cities, but also uh, the structures of our lives to actually make us all healthier. Uh, what do you think? I mean, you know, in, particularly in someone like New York City, how does one start to do that? Well, you know, it's, it's pretty fascinating, some of the statistics for uh, the closure of Broadway and Times Square and opening that space to pedestrians uh, actually reduced uh, air pollution by 60%. Um, there was a reduction in pedestrian injuries due to, um, you know, car pedestrian um, accidents by 40%. Um, the increase in biking um, throughout the city, uh, including in Times Square, um, is, has a tremendous impact on uh, people's everyday lives um, in terms of their own health and and um, the health of uh, the health of the city. Um, you know, in addition, there's. Um, well, I think that you made yeah. some excellent. I mean, I think you made some good points, particularly in terms of the city bike program. I know that lots of people have found that to be extremely freeing, uh, and particularly, of course, it, it impacts or lowers the impact uh, of carbon and, and pollution in our system when we're able to use public transportation like bicycles. Um, I've got a comment here from Justice Holmes, though, who says, you know, cities are not redesigning to encourage well-being. Cities like uh, NYC are allowing developers to steal light and air from average humans to give it to billionaires and using taxpayer money to do it. Living in perpetual shadow and watching Central Park destroyed by billionaire castles in the sky is hardly contributing to a feeling of well-being. You know, what do you think about that, Claire? There is a tension in New York City, isn't there, where, of course, uh, you've got kind of the top of the one percenters living in Manhattan where they, you know, there is this sort of need uh, or desire papers where people are building up and up and up. And of course, uh, there is this enormous shadow then thrown on those who can't afford it. Uh, how do you think that we're going to have to tackle that problem, uh, which is right here at our doorstep, but how is that going to have to be addressed in the future? I think the question of, uh, you know, the density of the built fabric in, in Manhattan is a really pressing question for us to be thinking about, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, in a space like Times Square, what the city has done is set a, a policy, uh, you know, a kind of paradigm for um, valuing pedestrian space, um, and that can be, you know, shared uh, you know, throughout, it, it sets an example for other plazas um, throughout the five boroughs. I think that's, well, I mean, you know, it's interesting. It's certainly going to be interesting to see how the waterways as well and the development of the waterways in New York actually may have some kind of contribution towards our overall well-being. I've got a comment here. This is from iSapien who says, so can it be said that certain architectural styles categorically provoke depression? Uh, for example, brutalism. Colin, uh, what do you think of that? Well, there's, there's some really interesting research suggesting that we do have kind of... Uh, immediate responses to certain types of geometries. Um, so in particular, if you compare people's responses to curves in architecture with their responses to kind of more angular, jagged architectures, um, you can actually light up uh, an easily measurable response that drills right down to uh, people's brain states when they're confronted with those different kinds of architecture. In terms of brutalism, I think that probably could be related to what I was saying earlier about the influence of different kinds of facade styles. You have to think about what's most available to the pedestrian at street level, which is, you know, about the bottom 10 feet of the facade. And when that's blank, when that doesn't have anything to attract the eye, has no uh, features at all, then that is going to improvably um, change people's emotional states. It's going to, I'm not sure I'd go so far as to say it would depress them, but it would certainly put them into a more negative state. Yeah, Tom, I want to give you the final word on this, particularly when it comes to how we're redesigning our spaces. Uh, do we have to be mindful of the architectural styles, in your opinion? Are there certain styles that lend themselves more to making people feel a bit more depressed? Well, yes, I would, I would sort of echo what Colin just said. I think what's really important is what happens along the street. What are the experiences people have uh, in their daily existence? I'm much less concerned about what the tops of buildings look like because most people uh, aren't really affected by that particularly. But yes, we've done a terrible job, not just architects in terms of too many blank walls against streets, but this has been driven by zoning policies 
Um, and uh, basically an idea that you design the building from the inside out. We have got to flip that around and design buildings from the outside in and really uh, pay attention to the day-to-day uh, -day experience of people in cities. I think it's an excellent point. Uh, you know, and it's going to be really exciting to see how uh, not just uh, Minnesota, but also how in Santa Monica uh, that you guys are being able to affect some change. And of course, right here in New York City, we'll be monitoring the Times Square redesign very closely, uh, of course. Guys, thank you very much for joining me today on HuffPost Live. Claire, Colin, Julie and Tom, thanks for being with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and guys, for more information on urban design and how it affects wellness, check out the links in our resource well below. And stick around, Josh Zepps is up next with the fine print.